Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 180, Sea Battles, Death at Scapa Flow. Last time, as war was declared and the British Royal Navy, as Churchill said, had drawn its sword once again, the two sides faced off in the icy waters of the Atlantic. Winston, now the first Sea Lord of the Admiralty, had decided to go after the German subs that, if allowed to go unchecked, would attempt to bring a halt to the vast quantities of supplies coming to the home island. As such, two hunting groups were pulled together and based around two carriers, Ark Royal and Courageous. But as the sailors and their political boss would discover, the German subs had the advantage in this fight. On September 14th of 39, the Ark Royal was hunting in the Hebrides off the west coast of Scotland. There, the sub U-39 spotted the British carrier before she knew the sub was even there. Right away, the sub's commander fired off three torpedoes, hoping at least one of them was not a dud. His prayer was not answered by the god of war, Mars. Each torpedo exploded soon after, leaving the sub. The carrier was safe. As for U-39, three nearby destroyers gave chase. Soon, due to the sheer volume of the depth charge attack, U-39 surfaced. When the hatch was opened, the men raced out, not to surrender to the British, but to get away from the chlorine gas that was making its way through the damaged vessel. Still, it was a British victory, the first enemy sub to be taken out of the war. However, the fortunes of Churchill's maritime cavalry would change drastically three days later. On September 17th, U-29, commanded by Captain Otto Schuhart, was operating 350 miles west of Ireland. Since the beginning of the war, he had already sunk three ships and hoped to net a fourth on this day. But even he was startled when, looking through his periscope, he spotted the carrier Courageous. The 22,500-ton battlecruiser turned carrier, was coursing at a high speed, too fast, in fact, to be attacked. However, Mars this time took the attacker's side. The Courageous then slowed down to allow several aircraft to land. Taking advantage of the enemy crew's focus on the approaching aircraft, the U-29 edged closer to about 3,000 yards. Even more astounding, two of the carrier's four screening destroyers had recently left to help a merchant vessel being attacked by another sub, and Schuhart couldn't see any anti-sub patrols flying overhead. The circumstances presented to him would never again be this good. The sub-commander knew the time had come to strike, yet having had magnetic pistols fail him before, the tubes were filled with contact exploding torpedoes. Three were quickly released. The sub dove deep. The crew counted the seconds, waiting to hear either explosions or nothing. The latter would put their lives in the greatest danger. Shuhat, counting like everyone else, was about to give up, but then heard an explosion, then another. In the vessel's log, he later recorded, we can clearly hear the explosions from two torpedo hits. Then, immediately after the second hit, an enormous explosion followed by a few smaller ones. The noise is so loud that I have the impression that we ourselves have been damaged. The captain needn't have worried. His sub was safe. However, the courageous was not. After being struck by the two torpedoes, the carrier heeled to port. It disappeared 20 minutes later. Of the 1,200 men and officers, 518 were lost. This normally would not have been the case. 20 minutes is a relatively long time to ready for evacuation. But as the group had been rushed to sea, with Churchill wishing it so, there had been no time to bring on enough flotation devices. As for the life rafts, they hadn't been moved in years and were, in fact, stuck to the ship through layers of paint. The two remaining destroyers harassed the sub, but could not kill her. 
U-29 made its way back home to be awarded, having scored the Kriegsmarine's first major success. Churchill gruffly ordered the carriers not to be used for sub-hunting. He would later claim that his plan had worked, but that was when the circumstances were vastly different. When U-boats started being sunk in large numbers, it was because of the escorts guarding the convoys. Just sending ships out to look for subs was practically useless. But when guarding a convoy, that was different. The subs had to come to the escorts, thus in a relative way, giving away their position. But the Kriegsmarine's best days were still ahead. Commodore Carl Donitz, flag officer commanding U-boats, had been eyeing the British base at Scapa Flow, just north of Scottish mainland, even before the war broke out. It was his job to. He knew from various reports of its many defenses, the air and sea patrols, the aligned block ships to prohibit the entry of subs, its booms, chains laid across entranceways, either on the surface or just below, of its nets and, of course, the minefields. Yet nature had lent a hand as well. Its currents were unusually fast, its tides far from standard. In fact, the Germans had lost two subs during the last war, trying to gain entrance. The result being, those of the Royal Navy assumed it was beyond safe. But upon closer inspection, and Donitz had Scapa Flow spied on before the war, he knew that the air patrols were inadequate. Many of its block ships had disintegrated over the years. Its nets were only single-strand loop wire and there weren't as many anti-sub-vessels patrolling as there should have been. Churchill knew most of this as well when he became First Sea Lord and wanted new block ships installed, certainly in the channel of Kirk Sound, between the southeastern mainland and the small island immediately below it, as they seemed to be in the worst condition. But the repairs would come too late. Donitz further was informed by the Abwehr, Germany's military intelligence, that in the Kirk Sound there was a gap between the sunken block ships and the shore of some 550 feet. This was enough to allow a sub to pass through, provided it was on the surface and if the sound was at high tide. And thanks to the weather department, Donitz knew that during the night of October 13th, 14th, the two times of high tide would come at night. Donitz had his window of opportunity. What he needed now was a commander unafraid of a most likely one-way operation, someone with nerves of steel who could focus on completing the mission and not his own escape. Donitz found that person in Captain Lieutenant Gunther Preen of U-Boat 47. As for the sub's crew... They were not told of their destination until out to sea. Their response was a collective giving up of hope of ever coming back alive. And yet, the first part of their raid went perfectly. The high tide lifted the sub. The current pushed the vessel into the bay at 11.30 p.m. on October 13th. Just after midnight, Captain Preen told his crew, We are in Scapa Flow. But that's when all the careful planning seemed to be for nothing. Looking around through his periscope, Preen did not see any of the numerous ships he'd had been expecting to find. Turns out, and no intelligence gathering can be perfect, that all the battleships had recently left in an attempt to keep the battlecruiser Gneisenau bottled up. However, after continuing his search, the sub-captain found one lone battleship, No, make that two battleships. Preen was relieved. And wrong. The first vessel he spotted was a battleship, the Royal Oak, a 29,000 tonner. But the second vessel to its north was just the seaplane tender Pegasus. U-47 crept along the northern shore, getting closer to the two supposed battleships. Once he was within 3,000 meters of the closest ship, the more southerly one, the true battleship, 
Preen let off three torpedoes, one at the seaplane tender and two at the Royal Oak. Whether it was excitement or flawed record-keeping, the captain recorded several facts incorrectly. Truth is, the first torpedo launched hit the real battleship's bow at 1.16 a.m. Damage was slight, but the explosion itself was mistaken for a reaction in the paint locker. As such, the ship was not put on alert, which itself does not make much sense. But as Scapaflo was for all intents and purposes impregnable, no one thought of a sub-attack, so the alarm for general quarters was not given. Most of the men went back to their hammocks. The two other torpedoes missed completely, so the sub turned around and fired off a single torpedo from astern. That, too, missed. By now, the crew had reloaded the bow tubes and ready to fire again. So the sub was once again pointed at the closest battleship, the Royal Oak, and a spread of three torpedoes was launched. This was 13 minutes after the first torpedo had been sent out. Amazingly, no alarm had been raised. Captain Preen had the area to himself without the distraction of a depth charge attack. This time, all three torpedoes hit the Royal Oak on its starboard side, and the force of the explosions lifted the battleship out of the water. Then cordite, the slow-burning propellant used to ignite explosives, caught fire in a magazine, which caused a large, darting, dancing fire that spread from compartment to compartment. Any and all men within these were cremated on the spot, due to the volume of cordite. Following hard upon the moving flames was the seawater as it rushed through the ruptures. With the added and uneven weight, the battleship heeled over to its starboard side. The men, lucky enough to be on deck, and this was far too few of them, slid down the flat metal and landed in the water. Many of them, the lucky few, survived. As for those below decks, the vast majority of them went down with the ship, trapped. In 15 minutes, the battleship rolled over and sank. Of its 1,200-plus crew, only 424 men survived, officers and men. Though a search for a sub was not launched right away due to the confusion and a lack of support craft, the civilian trawler Daisy 2 rushed out to rescue survivors. Within a very short time, the trawler had so many oil-covered passengers on board, she herself almost went down. Commander John Gatt had no choice. He ordered the Daisy 2 to her moorings. The reason harbor personnel did not look for an attacking sub was that, during those critical first few hours, it was believed that Royal Oak had been sunk by an internal explosion. By the time the truth was discovered, U-47 was safely on its way back to Germany. Once it arrived, Captain Prenn was awarded the Knight's Cross by Hitler himself. Matching this acknowledgement of a daring job, this boldest of bold enterprises, was Churchill. He spoke of the German crew's obvious skill and daring. But now that Scampa Flo was shown to be pregnable, the first Sea Lord had the home fleet moved to Rosyth in the Firth of Forth and to Loch U on the west coast of Scotland. On a bittersweet note, the block ships ordered by the Admiralty to protect Kirk Sound were delivered the day after the Royal Oak was lost. Admiral Reeder's gamble had paid off. With the German Navy enjoying such staggering successes, the naval leader with the newly promoted Rear Admiral Donitz, went back to Hitler. Their request was simple, unrestricted submarine warfare. On October 16th, Reeder had put his thoughts in writing, called an economic warfare plan. It stated that giving the subs their own way wasn't an act of cruelty. Simply, the harsher the measures against British shipping, the faster the war could be over hopefully before the U.S. got in, which seemed inevitable to Germany's leadership. Reader wrote, 
The more ruthlessly economic warfare is waged, the earlier it will show results, and the sooner the war will end. But even Hitler recognized the gamble this represented. If they were not careful, it would be the great war played out all over again. Yes, the scale was vaster now, but it still came down to industrial might and money. Germany could not stand up to both the United States and Britain over an extended period. One of them, obviously Britain, had to be forced out of the war before the other came in. Reeder and Donitz didn't walk away from their meeting with Hitler with a yes, but they didn't hear no either. At first, Der Fuhrer said that it was okay to sink any vessels that radioed it was under attack by a U-boat. Obviously, they were expecting the British Royal Navy to assist, so by Hitler's logic, they were legitimate targets. Then the German leader lifted the ban on attacking any vessel that ran without lights. Clearly, they were trying to avoid the U-boats, hence they were carrying aid to Britain. Then the German naval prize law, dealing with anything found on vessels captured, was to be ignored, but only in the North Sea. Then that was expanded to the area west of the British Isles. I believe that's called the North Atlantic. By the end of November of 39, just three months into the war, unrestricted submarine warfare was, once again, the German Navy's main mode of operating. Donitz radioed to his sub-captains, Rescue no one and take no one on board. We must be hard in this war. But Reeder wasn't done yet. He knew the odds were mightily against him and his navy, so wanted every option open to him. He asked his leader for the pocket battleships Deutschland and Admiral Graf Spee to also be allowed to hunt for merchantmen supplying Britain. They had been sent out to sea since before the war came and had started raiding on September 26th. But Reeder wanted them on par with the subs, but for reasons not obvious to Hitler. If the pocket battleships caught a few supply ships, that was fine. But what interested Reeder more was the British reaction to these attacks. As time went on, more and more escort vessels would have to be paired up with each cargo ship. Hence, the line of British vessels blocking German ports would have to be weakened. This somewhat went over Hitler's head. But Reeder knew that if the day ever came when the German Navy was bottled up, the end of the war was just a matter of time. The numbers were always going to be against him and his. To combat this, the British and French navies formed at least eight hunting groups to go after the subs. As we have seen, events had forced Churchill to give up the idea of forming hunting groups around carriers. That wasn't their design job. Still, these groups of battle cruisers and cruisers searched high and low for enemy subs. And besides dealing with the vastness of the Atlantic, the Allies didn't even have a firm idea of the number of vessels out there working against them. More besides, once any survivors reported that their ship had been sunk, the raiders were long gone. As for the pocket battleships, they met every two weeks with their supply vessels, taking on fuel, supplies, and unloading prisoners. Berlin may have said, take no one on board, but the German crews could not get past the idea of any mercy they showed would hopefully be returned. But also making things easier for the German service vessels, because they could not slip underneath the waves, was the ability to read the enemy's mail. From the B. Diest, or the Kriegsmarine Intelligence Service, who deciphered British naval codes, the pocket battleships knew where the British were and where they were heading to next. They were also assisted by the secret naval supply service set up before the war. Not every German steamship was what it seemed. Some were working directly with the Navy, meeting them at designated times and locations to refuel the battleships and subs, hence extending their operating range. Compared to this intra-service cooperation and professionalism, 
The British naval intelligence came in a distant second. Not only could they not tell how many subs were at sea at any one time, or which ones were operating, they didn't even know until early November that the two pocket battleships were at sea, and one of them was misidentified. By then, the Grashby had just rounded the Cape of Good Hope, hoping for better pickings in the Indian Ocean. The quickly established British convoys of the Atlantic had ruined hopes of easy victories. Also by then, the Deutschland was on its way back home. Hitler did not want the ship that carried his country's name to be sunk, so had the name changed to Lutzow. With the situation thus, this left the Graf Spee as one of the few German surface vessels operating in the Atlantic. So Reeder ordered the Gneisenau and Schornhurst out on November 21st. Using the fog near the Ice Faroes, an archipelago halfway between Norway and Iceland, they made their way into the North Atlantic. But on November 23rd, the Schornhurst spied a large vessel. The Germans ordered the ship to heave to, so it could be boarded and searched, but it responded with increased speed. The Scharnhorst gave chase. The captain of the fleeing vessel, the armed British merchant cruiser Rawalpindi, got off the signal, enemy battlecruiser in sight, just before one of Scharnhorst's 11-inch shells landed nearby. The Rawalpindi, on patrol duty, incredibly fired back, with its six-inch guns. It was a foregone conclusion. Within 14 minutes, the Rawalpindi was wrecked. The Germans moved in to pick up survivors. But then the captain was informed that a British cruiser was on its way. The Scharnhorst broke off its search and rescue, having only picked up 27 men so far, to clear the area. The rest of the crew's 271 men froze to death. As for the pocket battleship Graf Spee, she had been raiding the trade routes of the Indian Ocean. In fact, Captain Hans Langsdorf had captured or sunk nine ships so far, and had taken many prisoners. His point of pride, however, was that not one life was lost during his time in the Indian Ocean. Being 45 years old, Langsdorf had seen the horror of Jutland, and strove to save lives, no matter the flag atop their vessel. But now that his presence was known in the Near East, it was time to come back to the South Atlantic. Always moving, showing up where he was not expected, was Langdorf's way of keeping his ship safe and his men alive. However, all this running about had taxed his engines, which by now needed an overhaul. But before heading home, Langsdorf had decided on one more raid. On December 6th, he transferred as many prisoners from his ship to the Altmark, the supply vessel that accompanied him. That tanker now held some 299 souls. His last target was going to be the supply ships near the River Plate estuary. That is made up of the Uruguay and Parana rivers that separates Argentina and Uruguay. On December 13th, at 6.08 a.m., Langsdorf's lookouts spied three ships, a larger one and two smaller vessels. Langsdorf right away assumed that it was a light cruiser and two destroyers, obviously guarding a convoy that was already over the horizon. At the time, the German vessel was 17 miles away. Standing orders from Berlin said that enemy war vessels were to be left alone. It was the cargo ships that kept Britain in the fight. However, Langsdorf felt his pocket battleship, with its 11-inch guns, could handle whatever was ahead. The captain ordered battle stations and an increase in speed. The day was sunny and clear. This would be over with soon. What the German vessel was rushing towards was really Force G, made up of the heavy cruiser Exeter and the light cruisers Ajax, which carried the pendant of Commodore Harry Harwood and the Achilles of the Royal New Zealand Navy. Harwood had a fourth ship, the heavy cruiser Cumberland, but that was undergoing a refitting in the Falkland Islands. 
Commodore Harwood strongly believed that it was only a matter of time before the Graf Spee made its way to the estuary. The pickings were too tempting, which is why he kept his force here, although reports came in of Langdorf's raids to the east. But now his guests seemed to have paid off, as smoke was spotted eastward. Harwood sent the Exeter to identify the approaching vessel. Soon after, the message came for the Exeter. I think it is a pocket battleship. So Harwood had been right. But what to do now? The enemy's six 11-inch guns had a much longer range, which would allow Langsdorf to stay at a safe distance and pound the British war vessels. If they tried to close in to get themselves within range of their six or eight-inch guns, that would make the Graf Spee's job that much easier. But Harwood had already given the matter a think. He would divide his forces and come at the more powerful enemy ship from two different directions, thus forcing Langsdorf to divide his guns. This didn't help very much whomever Langsdorf chose to focus on first. Still thinking he was coming at three smaller, weaker vessels, the Graf Spee came on. Harwood gave his orders, and the Exeter came at the German vessel from the south, while the Ajax and Achilles approached from the east. Langsdorf saw the enemies react and then realized his mistake in surmising their sizes, but it was too late to disengage now. So he focused his big guns on Exeter, while his smaller 5.9-inch guns aimed for the two smaller ships. The Graf Spee, because she could, fired first at 6.17 a.m., while the enemy was still about 17 miles away. Her three forward guns, raised for maximum range, sent 670-pound shells aloft. Those deadly shells landed all around the Exeter, until one hit and destroyed her forward turret, just in front of the ship's bridge. Metal splinters went flying backward. The two men on either side of Captain Bell died instantly. He only then realized that blood was running down his own face. Besides the deaths, and there were others of the bridge crew who had died, communications with the engine room and steering were wrecked. Captain Bell, ignoring his obvious head wound and the dead comrades around him, made his way to the conning position, the ship's secondary command station. The Exeter wasn't done fighting yet. Using a compass and yelling commands through a relay of sailors to the aft steering control and engine room, Bell once again engaged the Graf Spee. Hoping to use the element of surprise for who would continue attacking after suffering a direct hit, Bell launched his port and then starboard torpedoes. He guessed they probably wouldn't score a hit, but it would cause the German vessel to react, thus giving his crew a modicum of time for repairs. Langsdorf, meanwhile, had ordered black smoke to be released and turned away from the Exeter that was, surprisingly, still coming at him. So he ordered his guns to continue firing at her. Soon, on the Exeter, another forward turret was hit. The British vessel only had one turret left, and that was being fired manually. Still, the Exeter engaged. During all this, damage control parties swirled around the ship, filling holes, fighting fires, and getting rid of the cordite charges before they caught on fire and further damaged the vessel. Then the situation worsened for Captain Bell. At 6.45 a.m., just 20 minutes after the first shell had been fired, the Exeter listed even further, to the point that its last turret was now unusable as its controls were underwater. Langsdorf wanted to finish off the largest of the three ships, but the other two were making a nuisance of themselves. The two light cruisers coming from the east, at first, were not much of a threat, as the Ajax's float plane, reporting where their shells landed, confused which shells belonged to which ship, so its course corrections were all wrong. However, the Graf Spee continued firing on the two vessels 
which missed as the light cruisers weaved in and out. Then Harwood, not seeing any significant hits on the enemy yet, ordered both ships to move in closer, to 800 yards. This put the British vessels at a disadvantage, because as they were coming at the enemy, they could only use their forward turret. Then it got worse for them, as Langsdorf ordered one of the 11-inch guns to assist with this new threat. The Exeter used this reprieve to slowly leave the area. Now that the Ajax and Achilles were only 800 yards away, some of their shells started hitting the Graf Spee's upper works, where the secondary guns were located. This gave the two smaller vessels a small respite. Then a shell penetrated the Achilles on its waterline, just below the bridge. Four men were seriously wounded, as was the gunnery officer. Yet within seconds, others took their place, and the attack on the larger German vessel continued. Then a shell hit the Ajax, taking out two of its aft turrets. Harwood responded by turning his ship to launch four torpedoes. This had been another part of his plan, to get in close and then fire off torpedoes, hoping the German vessel would not have enough time to react. However, the torpedoes, probably because the Ajax was listing to such a degree, momentarily came out of the water. This allowed them to be spotted and reported to Langsdorf. He ordered the Graf Spee out of harm's way. Then the confusion that comes with war took over. Harwood was then told, incorrectly, that Ajax only had 20% of its ammunition left. As this battle would not be decided in the next ten minutes, the Commodore ordered his forces to pull back at 7.40 a.m. Harwood was thinking the fighting would continue after darkness when either he tried to engage the enemy during the night or the German vessel came after him and his. However, that was not Langsdorf's plans. Having received a slight wound himself, and with 37 men now dead, along with another 57 wounded, the Graf Spee was heading for the neutral port of Montevideo. What's more, Langsdorf examined his blackened and scarred ship and doubted it would make the journey back to Germany. The Ajax and the Achilles followed the enemy vessel at a respectful distance. When the Graf Spee made port, the two British ships stationed themselves in international waters outside the harbor. Together, they had 11 dead and 5 wounded. The Exeter made best speed for the Falklands. Aboard her were 53 dead crewmen and another 57 wounded. International law said that warships in neutral ports had 24 hours to make repairs, then they had to leave. But Langsdorf said that 24 hours was not enough time to make the Graf Spee seaworthy. They would be risking all hands if they left too early. The British maintained that the 24-hour law had to be upheld, or the ship could be interned. Here, the British were hedging their bets. If the Graf Spee came out, the two damaged light cruisers would do their best against her. The only reinforcement they had was the heavy cruiser Cumberland. But the question was, when would she get here and when would the Graf Spee come out? To further confuse Langsdorf, fake radio signals were sent out by the British to establish that the carrier Ark Royal and the battle cruiser Renown would soon arrive. Meanwhile, the Uruguayan government allowed the Graf Spee 72 hours. Langsdorf contacted Berlin and asked what were his options. He was told by Reeder that internment was not allowed, nor could they sink sanctuary in Buenos Aires, the pro-German capital of Argentina. Langsdorf made his decision. Just after 6 p.m. on December 17th, the Graf Spee weighed anchor and began to move. Staying behind it was the tanker Tacoma and several launches. The British were told of this, so moved closer. 
However, after the crash B was only four miles out, it stopped. Those still aboard were seen by the British climbing into the launches and making for the Tacoma. After they were all cleared, fire could be seen aboard the pocket battleship. Explosions followed. Sinking, the Graf Spee eventually settled down into the plate. The Ajax and Achilles sailed past, their crews cheering wildly. But they did more than that. After the Germans left, technicians were sent aboard the Graf Spee to remove its radar. Three days later, Langsdorff, who had saved hundreds of enemy lives over the last few weeks, literally wrapped himself into the ensign of the old Imperial Navy and killed himself. When Hitler heard of this, his only response was, he should have sunk the Exeter. The Allies once again controlled the North and South Atlantic, more or less. But more than that, after losing the Courageous and the Royal Oak, the Battle of the River Plate was the shot in the arm the British Royal Navy needed. Yes, as Churchill had said, the Germans possessed skill and daring, but His Majesty's Navy would, once again, strive to rule the waves. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 181, The Rule of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. We last left the political situation in Petrograd, on the edge of the abyss. Sorry about that. Prime Minister Kerensky was held up in the Winter Palace, barely being defended, while the Bolsheviks and other left-leaning delegates were gathering to meet nearby at the Second Congress of the Soviets. For the last few months, political violence, strikes, and propaganda had dominated the Russian capital. To the citizens of Petrograd, it seemed that Kerensky was done, that few listened to him anymore, and fewer still were willing to fight for him. Also during the last few months, as the reputation of the Bolshevik party grew, many of the Soviets throughout Russia came under their control. Now they wanted to meet and make it formal, and the law of the land. The Mensheviks and other non-Bolshevik leftists, trying to fight this, but believing they did not have the numbers, postponed the Second Congress until October 25th, to allow as many non-Bolsheviks as possible to participate. Still, days before the Congress was to start, Lenin was given the task by the Central Executive Committee of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, the larger party umbrella, to write up reports on state power, the war, and the land. The Congress opened on October 25th at 10.40 p.m. Lenin had been in the Smolny Hall, the former school for boys, the day before, on the 24th, but had been ordered to stay away by the Executive Committee. That order would not keep him away. However, in attendance on the first night were between 650 and 700 delegates. Honestly, it was hard to tell, as the massive room was thick with cigarette smoke. This in comparison to the 1,429 Soviets throughout Russia, of which 455 were peasant deputies, people truly concerned with the lowest class. Of those in the hall, 300 were Bolsheviks, the largest group, 100 socialist revolutionaries who mostly sided with the Bolsheviks, and the rest made up of the other political formations, the Mensheviks, the Bundists, United Internationalists, and Ukrainian Socialists. The discussion-slash-debate started with the obvious issue of import, the powers of the Congress. Was this to be the ruling body for Russia? For clearly Kerensky was on his way out. The vast majority agreed that it was indeed time to fulfill the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, meaning those entities scattered throughout Russia that were concerned with the peasants 
the landless, everyone who had never taken part in ruling or running Russia. However, before this conversation could go very far, one of the non-Bolsheviks stood up to criticize Lenin's faction for the faint accompli, what with all the political violence and demagoguery, centered on Lenin. The vast majority of Petrograd had never seen the man before, but they knew his name, and more importantly, his words. It was the Lenin-led faction of the Bolsheviks that had troops around the Winter Palace. Then Martov, the leading Menshevik, stood up and attempted to cancel out what the Military Revolutionary Committee, the recently created military arm of Lenin's faction of the Bolsheviks, had done by offering a resolution for a peaceful solution and immediate negotiation to create an all-inclusive, all-democratic government. Before any of Lenin's men could raise a protest, that's not what Lenin had been angling for, the resolution passed with roaring applause. This led to another criticism of Lenin's Bolsheviks that stated, we know it was Trotsky that ordered an assault on the Winter Palace, and the arrest of those inside. To further show their anger, and having satisfied themselves by passing Martov's rather vague resolution, most of the non-Bolsheviks then walked out. If the departing delegates thought that was the end of the first day of the Congress, then they clearly did not understand the medal of Lenin and his faction. The remaining delegates mostly under Lenin's control, though he was not there that night of the 25th, agreed to recess at 2.40 a.m. Some 30 minutes later, the Congress reopened, but this time it was mostly attended by the Bolsheviks and those socialist revolutionaries who supported Lenin's ideas. At the exact same time the first session had been going on, the Petrograd Soviet had held a special session. There, the members were told that the provisional government's ministers had all been arrested. They were, in fact, just sitting around a table, waiting to be taken away. When their seizure was announced at the reopened Congress, the delegates cheered. Now was the moment Lenin and his followers had worked so hard and suffered for. A paper written by Lenin, but read out by Luna Charsky, got the debate started about what should happen to the state's power. A few changes were made, put forth by the socialist revolutionaries, but at 5 a.m. a vote was taken, which passed overwhelmingly. It stated that this Congress, mostly attended by Bolsheviks because the others had left, was taking power into its own hands. Furthermore, power throughout the provinces was to be passed over to the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants to effect a genuine revolutionary order. Of those voting back in Petrograd, only two opposed and twelve abstained. But it was done. Everything the anti-Tsarist, anti-bankers, anti-landowners had been working for had come to fruition. The people, through the Bolsheviks, now ran the country. The first session came to a close at 5.15 a.m. Later that morning, as the sun came up, Russia had no functioning government. The provisional government's members were in jails, jails that had recently held many Bolsheviks. However, the world was little aware of what had happened earlier that morning. The trams and buses in Petrograd still ran. The people went about their business. Shops functioned normally, and theaters planned their various shows for that night. Also, the Russian army was yet to find out about its new masters. The second session, started that night of October 26th at 9 p.m., was more focused on the details, now that the grand gesture was behind them. Lenin showed up this night under a peasant's hat, which he would continue to wear, and spoke or read papers he had written out beforehand. The first was on the decree of peace, which passed unanimously. It basically said that Russia would withdraw from the Great War. 
Lenin's next speech slash paper was his decree on land. That passed as well, but not unanimously. It went against what had been agreed to earlier by upholding the seizures of land by individual peasants and those taken collectively. Before anything else could be discussed and voted on, Trotsky had wanted a resolution attacking the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries that had left during the first session. But that was nothing more than revenge, and Lev Kamenev, the chairman of the Soviet's Central Executive Committee, recognized it as such. Instead, he had been working, for the last few hours, to build a coalition government with the left-leaning socialist revolutionaries who had voted along with Lenin's Bolsheviks. However, they, the socialist revolutionaries, could not agree on this, as it left out all the other parties. The two ideas went round and round with no agreement in sight. So at 2.30 a.m., Kamenev announced a temporary, exclusive, all-Bolshevik government. Kamenev won the night by getting the vote passed, but it was Trotsky's victory, as he had been able to punish and exclude all of Lenin's enemies. So, where was Stalin during all of this? He was there, and in fact had spoke to the Petrograd Soviet on the night before the conference. But when the other factions walked out and left the Bolsheviks practically alone, Stalin then started working behind the scenes to mediate a compromise. But not Trotsky. And, as we have seen, his way worked. Stalin quickly became jealous and offered up his resignation from the party newspaper. However, to his better future, the executive committee did not accept his leaving. Not being allowed to walk away from his post, Stalin, the practical, the pragmatic, again attempted to get out ahead of where the people were, a place Lenin seemed to occupy almost alone, but more importantly, to get the attention of their leader. Just after the conference ended, Stalin wrote, Power to the Soviet means the thorough purging of every government office in the rear and at the front, from top to bottom. Power to the Soviet means the dictatorship of the proletariat and the revolutionary peasantry. Open mass dictatorship exercised in the eyes of all, without ploys and behind-the-scenes work, for such a dictatorship has no reason to hide the fact that no mercy will be shown to the lockout capitalists who have intensified unemployment or to the profiteering bankers who have increased the price of food and caused starvation. Certain classes brought on the misery. Other classes will bring salvation. This is the class nature of the slogan, All Power to the Soviets. But who was to exercise the power of the state? For now, its directives would be issued by a newly created Soviet Central Executive Committee. On it, in order of importance, or rather, in order of those held in high esteem by Lenin, were himself, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Zverdlov, and Stalin. Though last on the list, this was the beginning of a new race, a new challenge, a new battle, and Stalin recognized that. And he would make the most of one seemingly insignificant detail. Lenin only allowed two people unfettered access to himself, even when in his private apartment in the Bolshevik headquarters at Smolny, and one of them was Stalin. Slowly, word spread of the Bolsheviks' actions during the Second Soviet Congress, but in response, there was no mass celebrations, as there had been during the February Revolution. The reasons were rather straightforward. For one, there was no major across-the-country announcement from the Bolsheviks. Secondly, all the other left-leaning organizations didn't just disappear overnight. The Petrograd Soviet still functioned, as did the Menshevik Party. But more than that, there was not a governmental formation. There were just men in the Smolny issuing proclamations and orders, but there was no one 
to hand them off to. There was no structure. To be sure, there were armed men outside the Smolny, but they were just guards, not officials implementing policy. Also, the people, as much as they loved what Lenin professed his goals to be, did not give up their own collective farms or their own burgeoning political entities. Lenin's party only paralleled the peasant gatherings. It did not replace them. Fortunately, the Bolshevik entity with Lenin at its head did not have to fight the Russian army outright. The military had been gutted by the Great War and the Great Russian Offensive of 1917. They were spent as a fighting force. As for the political right, some of them, many of them, to varying degrees, were happy the Bolsheviks had grasped power. Now they, the Bolsheviks, would fail, as had the provisional government, and when everyone witnessed their ineptitude for themselves, the right could get on to real governing and denying the peasants what they wanted. Attempting to get on with really running the country, the executive committee appointed commissars for various governmental duties. The 13 commissars lived at the Smolny, as did Lenin, and sought to take over the ministries, now supposedly under their domain. Stalin made the commissar for nationalities, told Lenin that as the provisional government had no such ministry, there was nothing for him to take over. So he focused on the state newspaper, borrowing money from Trotsky so he didn't have to go looking for any, and establishing himself further with Lenin. This last part seemed to be working, as Lenin would call on Stalin several times a day, and together they would walk throughout and around the Smolny. Lenin seemed to have wanted to remain semi-hidden and work through his commissars. As such, Trotsky was given the position of chairman, which the younger man turned down. Instead, he took up the position of foreign affairs commissar. For the meantime, Zverdlov remained the one to organize Bolshevik party matters. And yet, very little governing was getting done. A real functioning government issues orders and laws. Someone carries them out and makes sure they are observed. Breakers of the laws are punished and the like. But that was not happening. Lenin had come this far on his personality and force of will. But this part of his plan needed basic day-to-day administration, which was not being fulfilled. Which makes sense. Lenin, the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars and Journalists, was really just a pamphleteer. Trotsky was also a writer and an effective speaker, but had little to no experience in running his department. But more on that in a moment. Zverdlov, as we have seen, was at least an effective organizer, but carried out the will of others. As for making policy under the large umbrella of Leninism, he was unsure of what to do day to day. This leaves Stalin, who had previously robbed banks, or had banks robbed, and had resisted government troops, or organized resistance. But as for running a department of nationalities, which was to focus on the non-Russian nationalities, making sure they were treated equally, he, the former terrorist, who had an inability to care for others, even for his wife and son, was not equipped for such a post. Truth to say, his heart wasn't in it. But at least he was on the Council of People's Commissars. The number of people below him politically was much larger than the opposite, and that's what he had always sought since leaving the seminary. From this group of commissars around Lenin were issued forth papers or decrees on everything from ridding Russia of social ranks, social insurance for all wage workers, the establishment of a Supreme Council of the Economy, and state monopoly in grain and agricultural implements. And with Lenin's signature at the bottom of each one of these, they had the force of law, had someone been enforcing the law. 
Clearly, money was going to be needed to make this new government run. So, Stanislaw Pestkowski, who had mentioned, in passing, that he had studied a bit of economics in London, was made the head of the state bank. However, when he entered that institution with a letter signed by Lenin of his new position, the employees laughed until he left. Pestkowski would then go on to work for Stalin, who let him run the day-to-day operations of the Nationalities Office. Stalin had bigger fish to fry. When Trotsky, not a small or unattractive man, entered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs building, carrying a similar letter as Pestkowski, he too was ignored and made fun of. After he left, most of the staff quit when they learned from others of the rather direct method Trotsky used to get his way since the February Revolution. And yet, more troubling reality was heading the Bolsheviks' way. After October, just as after the February Revolution, numerous parties, groups, and organizations rose and claimed responsibility of power. Suddenly, the circus-like atmosphere around the Smolny, where the commissars issued decrees, only to have them mostly ignored, was also happening in other buildings, now being used as headquarters for the other new ruling coalitions. But the Bolsheviks and those left-leaning entities were about to get an example of real power. Soon after October, the Railway Workers' Union, who could bring a city, any moderately-sized city, to a standstill, made it clear they wanted a government without Lenin and without Trotsky. Simply, they didn't trust them. And considering what Lenin had in mind for the future, they were right not to. What's more, the Germans were still there, grabbing more and more of European Russia. If this continued, they might end up being the new rulers of Russia, or at least its western half. Now that Lenin and his faction had officially claimed power, putting the provisional government aside, which had itself replaced the Tsar, the new leader would go on to focus on his ultimate goal, the Bolshevik dictatorship. For, indeed, it had never been his intention to share power with other Marxists, not even other Bolsheviks. They were all nothing more than stepping stones, paving the way to total power. Thanks to Blue Apron for sponsoring this week's episode. Don't forget to use the code WORLDWAR to get your first three meals free.